ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار then we continue with this point because it was a lengthy one and it's been going on for maybe four or five lessons and that is a point 101 of Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah who died in the year 329 the explanation of Sheikh al-Fawzan so the point he talks about here uh, 101 which actually begins where he mentions that some of the ulama from them Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal that he held that the denier of the attributes of Allah and the names of Allah the Jahmi then he is a kafir and he is not from Ahl, then he is not from the people of Islam due to his denial then he mentions that they went to such a deviation meaning the uh, Ahlul Bid'ah the Jahmi and the Mu'tazila that they made permissible the spilling of the blood of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the name of Islam and they put the people to trial and then he also mentions that by way of their deeds and their beliefs that Islam was weakened J- jihad was uh, left off and, and nullified in reality and that they became busy with dif- with differing and splitting and they opposed and they abandoned the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the people that they started doubting in their religion and that is where we where we left off last week and I've just summarized actually what this long point is. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact being that the whole of the discussion is about how innovations began and how they became widespread and how they took root. And this is where we have reached now, how they actually took root. And they became such so widespread that they became in reality the system that was implemented in a land. It was the norm. And this is where Imam al-Barbahari, he said, he said, فَدَامَتْ لَهُمُ الْمُدَّةِ So some time passed by over them. Over who? Over, you know, Ahlul Bid'ah. Meaning that they, some, some, some uh, time passed by whilst they were busy with their innovations. وَوَجَدُوا مِنَ السُّلْطَانِ مَعُونَةً عَلَى ذَلِكَ And they found the innovators, they found support from the ruler in their innovations. So they headed towards the ruler, and that is something, barakallahu feekum, that the ulama, they mention. The Ahlul Bid'a, you find them constantly seeking a way to the ruler. Because by way of the ruler, if they can convince him, then they will implement their innovations in their land. And this is why Ikhwan al-Muslimin, of course, always try to get as close to the Muslim rulers as they can, whilst the other wing of Ikhwan al-Muslimin tries their utmost to rebel and shed the blood of the Islamic governments and the Islamic rulers. So Ikhwan al-Muslimin, of course, is an organization with two faces. A face that enters into parliament in democracy and coming close to the rulers and the rule of law. And another face that rebels and opposes and spills blood because they believe that if one fails then you must take the other route this is the way of Ikhwan so throughout history this is even though Barbahari is saying this over a thousand years ago but actually it's something that has always been the case with Ahlul Bid'ah that what they do is as he has, as he has mentioned وَوَجَدُوا مِنَ السُّلْطَانِ مَعُونَةً عَلَى ذَلِكَ that they found with the ruler they found support from the ruler in that regard, meaning in their innovations. 
And they put to the sword and the whip those who were upon something different to themselves. فَدَرَسَ إِلْمُ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاءَ وَأَوْهَنُوهُمَا That they extinguished the knowledge of the sunnah and the jama'a and they suppressed it, they weakened it. وَصَارَتَ مَكْتُومَتَيْنِ لِإِذْهَارِ الْبِدْعِ وَالْكَلَامِ فِيهَا So the sunnah and the jama'a that they became concealed that they ended up being hidden and concealed due to the manifestation of bid'a and false speech about innovation, meaning false speech that rotates around their innovation. So speech and innovation, they cause the sunnah to become hidden and concealed. And then he mentions, وَلِكَثْرَتِهِمْ and, and due to the large numbers of Ahlul Bid'a, so what happened to the sunnah? The sunnah became concealed and it became hidden due to the manifestation of innovation and false speech regarding it and due to the large numbers of Ahlul Bid'a. He said, Rahimahullah, وَاتَّخَذُوا مَجَالِسَ وَأَذْهَرُوا رَأْيَهُمْ So they would set up gatherings and they would make manifest their opinions and their views and their ideas in those gatherings. And they wrote books and they placed, yani they authored books regarding their views. And they enticed the people. And they sought for them leadership. So they occurred great tumult, fitna. Because of all of this, لم ينجو, لم ينجو منها إلا من عصم الله. And no one escaped and was saved from that except for those, those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected. فَأَدْنَ مَا كَانَ يُصِيبُ الرَّجُلَ مِنْ مُجَالَسَتِهِمْ أَنْ يَشُكَّ أن يشك في دينه. and the least and the least that a man would be affected by in his sitting with them is that he would doubt he would enter into doubt concerning his religion أو يتابعهم or that he would follow them أو يرى رأيهم على الحق and he would consider and he would see their opinion and consider it to be the truth. وَلَا يَدْرِي أَنَّهُ عَلَى الْحَقِّ أو عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ Whereas in reality, whereas in reality, he would not, uh, يعني that he would not be able to, he, he does not know what is haqq and what is batil. He wouldn't know in reality. He doesn't know whether it is truth or whether it is falsehood. فَصَارَ شَاكًا And thus, he became one who was filled with doubts. فَهَلَكَ الْخَلْقُ حَتَّى كَانَ أَيَّامَ جَعْفِرٍ الَّذِي يُقَالُ لَهُ الْمُتَوَكِّلِ and, and, and the creation, or oh meaning the people were ruined. That they were ruined because of all of this that was taking place up until the era of the rulership of Ja'far. And Ja'far is the one who is referred to as Al-Mutawakkil. فَأَتْفَعَ اللَّهُ بِهِ الْبِدْعَى So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala atfa'a, meaning that he extinguished بِهِ الْبِدْعَى That by way of Al-Mutawakkil, the ruler, the caliph, Allah extinguished the innovations by way of him. وَأَذْهَرَ بِهِ الْحَقِّ And Allah made the truth manifest through him. وَأَذْهَرَ بِهِ أَهْلَ سُنَّتِي And by way of him, أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ became uppermost. By way of him. So then he said, Imam al-Barbahari, in the last line, he said, وَطَالَتْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ 
مع قلتهم وكثرة أهل البدع إلى يومنا هذا So he said So أهل السنة By way of him they became uppermost And they spoke out openly Meaning أهل السنة They spoke out openly Despite their small numbers And despite the large number of Ahlul Bid'ah And that has continued right up until this day So those are the words of Imam Al-Barbahari Rahimahullah So Shaykh Al-Fawzan he said regarding the first line So some time passed by And the innovators found support from the ruler in their innovations so, of course, we're talking about the same era of the Jahmiya. The Jahmiya, they spread their bid'ah. They were weak in the early part. They were confined to certain locations. The rulers were tough against them. Ahlul Sunnah was strong. The Tabi'een were strong. The heads of the Jahmiya, Ja'd ibn Dirham and Jaham bin Safwan, his student, both of them were executed. Uh, shortly after the 100th year, 124 and 128 respectively. So they were weak, but slowly but surely they spread, and they spread, and they found purchase with the juhal, with the ignorant ones, up until some time passed by, and then, as he mentioned, وَوَجَدُوا مِنَ السُّلْطَانِ مَعُونَةً عَلَى ذَلِكَ they found with the ruler's support for what they were upon. So here, Sheikh Al-Fawzan, he said, and this is referring to the era of Al-Ma'mun and his offspring. Ma'mun, the caliph, the, uh, the, Ab the Abbasid or the, the Abbasi, the caliph, Al-Ma'mun and his offspring. So may Allah pardon us and pardon him pardon us and pardon him for they misled him and by way of him Ahlul Bid'ah harmed the people and they deceived him so they misled him and they deceived him and this is why they ended up becoming so strong because of the fact that though they were working behind the scenes and with the people and spreading their bid'ah, they were still, Ahl Sunnah was strong, Ahl Hadith was strong. Then these individuals, they got to the ruler, Al Ma'mun. Once they reached Al Ma'mun, they found with him strength, and through that strength, they caused huge amounts of damage. And that's why he said, Al Barbahari, they put to the sword and the whip those who opposed them, those who were different to them. So now, They've got the rulership. they got the ear of the ruler. So by way of that, they caused huge amounts of damage. Sword, whipping, imprisonment, torture, and other than that. This is Ahlul Bid'ah in every era. Even today, it's no different. Ahlul Bid'ah, when they are refuted, like you find them, some of them they are refuted by the ulama such as Sheikh Ubaid or Sheikh Rabia or Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hadi with the ilm, with writing, with evidences and proofs. And when they cannot respond that they go to the rulers or they go to the judge and the judge is not an alim like the level of those ulama that are refuting and he may not know the details so they try to go through the ruler and through the judges to have their even our ulama imprisoned. As they are trying now with the likes, or as they tried previously with the likes of Sheikh Ubaid and other than Sheikh Ubaid, that they would go because they don't have the knowledge and they don't want to repent and they don't want to give up the deviation that they are upon, then they will try to use the rulers to silence the people or to expel the people from the lands. And this is how Ahlul Bidah they work. As he mentioned, Sheikh Al Fawzan, meaning that they gained some authority in the time of Ma'mun over Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a. So, Ahlul Bida in the time of Ma'mun, and this is of course coming on, and that is the era of the likes of Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah, 
and the likes of towards the end of the life of Imam Shafi'i that they gained authority with the rulers. So this was that era, the era of Ibn Uyayna, Sufyan Ibn Uyayna, the era of Imam Shafi'i, the era of Ahmed Ibn Hanbal, Abdurrahman Ibn Mahdi, and those ulama. So Ma'mun, he gained authority, and through Ma'mun, the Jahmiya, by influencing him and getting close to him, they ended up harming Ahlu Sunnah. And they gained ascendancy and authority over Ahlu Sunnah. And he said, Sheikh Fawzan, وَهَذِهِ نَتِيجَةُ الْبِطَانَةِ الْخَبِيثَةِ And this is the result of taking foul companionship and advisors. So it is obligatory upon the Muslim, whether he be from the ruler, from the, meaning whether he be a ruler, or he be other than the ruler, it is obl obligatory upon him that he does not take a bitana except a bitana that is saliha. He does not take companionship and advisors and close friends except for those who are righteous and pious. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tattakhidu bitanatan min dunikum. He said, oh, uh, Allah said, O oh, you who believe, O oh, you who believe, do not take as close friends and advisors other than the believers, meaning other than yourselves, other than those who are like you from Ahlul Iman. La ya'lunakum khabala, since they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. From Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 118. So the Muslim. He is to take a companionship and take consultation and advice from those who are righteous. And he is cautious and careful from falling into a companionship and taking advisors from wicked people and evil people who are opposers of the sunnah and opposers of this da'wah that we are so familiar with, the da'wah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And that is especially so, he said, when it comes to the rulers. Especially so when it comes to rulers. Why? Because Ahlul Bid'ah, they have their... Because Ahlul Bid'ah generally, what do they want? They want leadership, rulership, followers, crowds. That's what they want. That's the whole da'wah. That's why they don't want to follow the sunnah. Because those who follow the sunnah, you're only going to get a limited handful of people with you. Because it is not your message. It's the message of Allah. So you can't alter it, you can't change it, so you can only give it as it is, whether the people like it or they don't like it. So they want to give to the people that which will bring around them huge numbers of people and power and authority so they can spread their evil ideas amongst them. So Ahlul Bid'ah, that they seek a path to the rulers, always, in every time and generation. And if they can't seek a path to the rulers... They pull down the rulers by killing them and rebelling against them. Either way, what do they want? Either the ruler will give us what we want, i.e. authority and followers and power, or what's going to happen is we'll remove the rulers and put ourselves in charge so that we have authority and rulership and power and we can do what we are doing. This is Ahlul Bid'ah. Ahlul Sunnah have no such you know, visions or sights upon any throne. Barakallahu feekum. That's not Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they advise the Muslim rulers, but they do not seek a seat on the throne. They do not seek positions. This was the way of Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, and the rest of the ulama before him and after him, from those who were close to the ulama, like Shaykh Al Fawzan in our times, Abdul Aziz ala Shaykh, Salih ala Shaykh, and other than them. That those who get close to the rulers, they do not seek rulership for themselves or following or to spread innovation or spread wickedness and evil. These are ulama that are salihin, that they are righteous and they are pious and they are ulama, they are God-fearing, they are muttaqeen. Those ulama that we know of and we know only good about them. As for Ahlul Bid'ah, then no, they have ambitions and goals. If we get this ruler, we can get, we can spread our bid'ah, and we can harm our enemies, and we can destroy so and such, so and so, and we can raise graves high in our land, and so on. This is what they want. 
So this is what they did to Al Ma'mun. He said, Sheikh Al Fawzan, uh, look what happened with the evil companionship with regard to Ma'mun. And Ma'mun, the Caliph, Rahimahullah, he was an intelligent man with nobility. He was the key, subhanAllah. He was alongside the fact that he was intelligent and he had nobility. And he was from Bani Hashim. His lineage went straight back to the Prophet Sallallahu and the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Bani Hashim. Alongside all of this, they misled him. And look what happens. Look what happens when you have evil companions and evil advisors around you. Look what happened even towards the end of the era of Banu al-Abbas. When you look at the era, the end of the era of the, of the authority, of the Abbasides or the Banu al-Abbas, that this was the era of the spread of the empire of the Mongols that came out of Central Asia. And then they spread towards the east into China and they took the whole of China. And then they moved south and they moved to the west and they headed towards the Arabian Peninsula. Even though they didn't reach, of course, the Jazeera, but they reached, you know, uh, the lands of what is modern day northern parts of India and northern parts of modern day Pakistan, then into Afghanistan and the northern parts of that. And then they moved into what is modern day Persia or Iran and then into Iraq and into Syria and into Sham and into the southern steppes of Ruf Russia and Russia itself. Then they moved across into Europe, into Hungary and they were the most murderous of individuals. And the whole idea was that they would enter, they would conquer and that they would cause such bloodshed and killing that their word would spread thousands of miles so even before the mongols would arrive the people would surrender this was the idea so they would rape and pillage and murder and kill so when we look towards the era of the end of banu abbas the the abbasi rulership and caliphate that he mentions that you know you look at the likes of ibn al-alqami and Tusi. He mentions these, so he doesn't actually mention what they did. But uh, one of them is Ibn al Alqami, and the other one is Al Tusi. As for Al Alqami, even though he doesn't mention, I think he is worthy of a mention because of his khubth and his wickedness and his treachery and his nifaq and his hypocrisy. This Mu'ayyad al Deen, even the name does not suit him. Mu'ayyad al Deen does not suit him. He's not any Mu'ayyad of any Deen. He is an individual. Uh, his name was Mu'ayyad al-Din al-Alqami. He died in the Christian era, 1258. So around about after the 6th century in the Hijri calendar. He was a Rafidi, Shi'i. And he was given the role of a minister amongst Banu al-Abbas. In the era of the Abbasi, Caliph Al Musta'sim. Al Musta'sim. Al Musta'sim was the Caliph. He was, of course, a Sunni. He was a person of Sunnah, as was his father and as was his grandfather. But when it came to his rule, he became soft towards, the, uh, towards Ahlul Bid'ah. And he would give them authority, he would appoint them governors and ministers and so on. So one of the ones that he appointed as a minister was this Al Alqami. So he became lenient towards the Rafi. He thought, you know, they live. So you know, if they if they're in my uh, caliphate or if they're in my rule, I'll give them some ministership and you know over Persia and other over other places. So Ibn Kathir said regarding him that the minister Ibn Al Alqami worked and worked with the ruler. So he'd come close to Al Musta'sim. And he would advise him, he became a close advisor to him. And he advised him that your army, you don't need such a big army anymore. The army in that time of the Muslim empire, Banu al-Abbas, 
numbered the standing army, numbered a hundred thousand troops, which was vastly superior than anything else, anything else at that time. Hundred thousand troops. I mean, if you consider the army of the United Kingdom, which is considered to be the fourth biggest in the world, is still less than a hundred thousand today. Right. So you can you can see how huge the army was, and of course the army was needed because of the fact that there was so much enmity towards Islam and the Muslims in defending their borders and bringing justice to the other lands. So his standing army began at the death of his father, Musta'sim's father. It was a hundred thousand, and his father's name was Al uh, Mustansir. So in the time of Al Mustansir, or towards the end of his life, uh, life as Ibn Kathir has mentioned, Al Bidayah and Nihaya that his standing army was a hundred thousand troops. Then Al-Alqami would go to the caliph and say, you don't need a hundred thousand. It's a waste of wealth. Reduce it down. So he eventually went to him and told him to reduce it down by ten thousand. And that's my advice to you. We can use the wealth elsewhere. So he reduced it out by ten. Then another ten. Then he, command, then he advised him that they don't need all of this equipment that they have. So then they took away from them their weaponry and their equipment. Because they said that we are so powerful and strong that no one can overcome us. This Alqami at the same time had entered into negotiations with the grandson of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, of course, the founder of the Mongol Empire. And, uh, of course, if you know anything about the Mongol Empire of that time, uh, as we mentioned, the 11th century or the 12th, uh, the, the 12th century, really, and towards the end of the of the 11th, uh, or the 13th century rather, towards the end of the 12th, that they were the most powerful force in terms of just their brutality. They did the same wherever they went. They didn't single out the Muslims, they did the same in China. They would go to a, a city and they would kill every man, woman and child and then they would leave one alive and they would send him to the next village. And what would they do? They would surrender even before they arrived. But they would kill people in their hundreds and thousands. Hundreds and thousands would get killed. right? And they would threaten them with rape and pillage and so on. Such that in some of the empires of the, the Qi empires or the Chinese empires, that they would take their, because uh, the Chinese had their own way and religion and ways of doing things, and they were behind huge fortresses and castles. So what they would do is that they would line up their virgins, on the top of the castle wall before the Mongols could could come in and they would just jump off the wall. It's recorded in some by some historians amongst the Chinese that 17,000 virgins in one day jumped off the highest peak in one of the surrounding one of the villages or one of the fortresses that was surrounded by the Mongols. So Mongols had certain ways and things that they used to do things. So they used to sometimes, even the way that they used to come in with huge fear. None of them, by the way, walked. The Mongols would not walk. They would always uh, they would always fight on horseback. So most armies, of course, you have foot soldiers and you have those that are on horseback or camelback. The Mongols, no. All of them were upon horses that were referred to as ponies. I mean, we think of ponies as baby horses, but these were... Uh, extremely fast steeds. You know, they could travel for a month and they would only require a few hours rest a day. Very lean uh, horses and they trained them just for the purpose. They were master archers. They said that when uh, Genghis Khan first came towards the east, he took an army towards the western, or towards the eastern empire of the Islamic world and when the Muslims looked out upon him and upon his army, that his front line alone was 15 miles wide. We're not talking about depth. So now you're looking at them coming towards you. The length of the army across in front of your sight of vision is 15 miles wide. Every single soldier is on horseback. Depth, tens of thousands in depth. This Al-Alqami, by the time of the, the era of the grandson of, of Genghis Khan, Haluku, who the Westerners referred to as Hilugu, by his time, of course, the Mongols had conquered 
because of the children and the grandchildren of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was the founder of the empire that they had spread into the uh, into China, parts of India, into Russia, and into whatever surrounded them. And there were people who never lived in houses. They never went into into towns and took castles and mansions and palaces to live in them. They never did that. You know, people like Genghis Khan himself and his children after him who became the leaders, even if they conquered towns and villages, they would see the palaces and they would leave them. It is reported about Genghis Khan himself when he entered into some of the huge palaces in China. He walked in and that was the first time they ever saw him afraid because he couldn't see how that roof is not falling on his head. And he refused to live in them and his grandchildren refused to live in them. They put their tents near rivers and lakes. Even when they became the most powerful force in the world at their time, they would still not live in palaces or houses or buildings or mansions of the lands that they conquered. They would take their, uh, their materials and their tents and their leather skins and they would set up their encampment by water. That's all they would do. And then they would move on. And they lasted like that for decades several decades and more than that so the mongols were a feared force so so now what do the muslims need to do in response they need to strengthen their armies so what did this ibn al-qami do he made a deal with halaku he said to him as ibn kathir has mentioned also ibn taymiyyah and others because this was the era of ibn kathir and ibn taymiyyah the mongols were active in the time of sheikh al-islam ibn taymiyyah ibn taymiyyah took a force against them he wouldn't surrender to them. So these, or we refer to them sometimes as the Tatars or the Tatar. Right? In the books of Ibn Kathir and Ibn Taymiyyah, they refer to as Tatar or the Tatars. Even in the writings of the of the Chinese who have written the most about it, and also I mean the two the, the, the three groups of people who have written most about the Mongols are the Chinese, the Muslim writers like uh, Ibn Kathir and those similar to him, and also some of the Christians when they reached Europe. And all of them, in fact, if you compare the writings, it's very similar what they're saying about these people. That they were, you know, the Christians thought that this is Juj wa Majuj coming out. They thought this is Gog and Magog that has been written in the Bible. They've come out of the mountain and they're going to kill and slaughter. They actually gave the hukum that this is what they are. So because, and you can imagine how, how you know, how they reached that level. So Haluku, uh, Al-Alqami went this Rafidi, and this is the point that Shaykh al-Fawzan is making, look at Ahlul Bid'ah, that they come to the, to the Muslim rulers and they seek authority. So, because of the leniency of some of the Muslim rulers, they may gain authority. And then behind their backs, they are treacherous towards Islam and the Muslimin and the Muslim rulers. So this Al-Alqami, Mu'ayyaduddin, that he went to Haluku and he said, that I will work with you because I have power as a minister. And what I will do is I'll reduce the force that is going to defend the Islamic lands. And what I request of you is that you kill the caliph and you give me some authority. That's all I ask. So he agreed. Al-Alqami. There was another one, as Sheikh uh, Fawzan has mentioned, At-Tusi. He did the same thing. But At-Tusi wasn't a minister. He was just a very influential person in society. But we'll come to Tusi in a minute. So anyway, the point I was making was that the 100,000 troops, Ibn, Ibn Kathir mentions the number 100,000, that the army on that side, Allahu A'lam what it was in the Maghrib, we're talking about on the Baghdad side, in the region from Baghdad towards the east. Allahu A'lam how many tens and thousands there were towards the western empire of the Islamic State. And of course, there were other rulers that were present and they were vying for power, but it was in general... You know, ulama and mashaykh and fuqaha were present. And even though Ahl al-Bidah did have a handhold and they were powerful, but nevertheless, it, they were Muslim lands all the way across into Spain with different, you know, different entities and different empires. But the largest of them was the Banu al-Abbas, the Abbasi Empire. So he went to the ruler, reduced it eventually from 10,000, 100,000 down to 10,000. Then the 10,000, he convinced the ruler to reduce their, uh, you know, their, their stipend or their salaries 
to reduce it down so they became almost in a state of poverty those soldiers now can't even feed their families and it was it was recorded by the by the mufassirin and the scholars of history that those 10000 that remained that they were uh, that they was that they resorted to begging in the marketplaces to live this is the army of the muslims now there was a time in between the 100,000 reducing down to 10,000 that Al-Alqami, he took a force of 10,000 from the Khalifa. And he said, I'll take a force and I'll make sure that that side is defended. When he took the force, his Al-Qami and those who were with him from the Mubtadi'a and the Rafida, that they, they took 100,000, he took the best, the most highly trained of the 100,000, he took 10,000 because that was that, that side of the land that they wanted protecting. When he took them, after taking them, after a period of time, he, he, he relinquished all of them from their duties and sent them home. He said, we don't need an army like you anymore. The 10,000 that is remaining, that is enough. So eventually it dwindled down to 10,000. So he struck his deal and he fulfilled his part of the bargain. He fulfilled his part of the bargain. So Al-Alqami was working with, you know, Helugu Khan the Mongol or the Tatar leader, to weaken the Muslims. And when they eventually came, he gave the order to the region that he was controlling that you are not to defend yourselves against the attack of the Mongols or the Tatar. All right. In reality, actually, the Mongols and the Tatar are two different tribes. But they're all referred to as Tatar, and sometimes they're always referred to as Mongols. But technically, they're two different tribes, but they all came under the rulership of Genghis Khan, who himself was a Mongol. Right, so they forbade the people, he forbade the people from opposing them. He was also linked to this Nasruddin al Tusi, and this is the other one that Sheikh al Fawzan has mentioned. What Tusi he mentions, well, Ibn al Alqami, what Tusi Tusi was a Rafidi Shi'i, he became an advisor to Haluku Khan or Haligu Khan. So, both of these Rafida. And others from them, from Ahlul Bid'ah, they worked closely with Haluku Khan to destroy the Abbasi Caliphate. They sacked Baghdad, they plotted with Haluku, and eventually they killed the Caliph. Because the, 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 the Khalifa, who we mentioned was Musta'sim, that he sent a message to Haluku that let's negotiate terms whereby you know the arm so that so the, the fighting stops because our people are dying so he came from a position of weakness to negotiate with him who set up the meeting the same al-alqami he went al-alqami and this tusi and they set up a meeting with halaku khan so when he went to him he said yes okay i want all of the treasures all of the gold all of the silver all of the wealth the dirhams and the dinar i want all of it bring it to me and then you will not be killed and we'll sign some agreement. This Alqami knew full well that this was a trick from Haluku. So the Khalifa had no choice. What is this to do? So he went and a few thousand of them with him that they brought all of the wealth and they put it in front of Haluku Khan. Piles of gold and jewelry and silver. After he took the wealth uh, he only allowed 17 of them to come in and Haluku ordered and they, be, they killed him, they beheaded the caliph killed him, took his wealth and killed him and killed all of his family and all of those 17 of his, of his supporters that were with him, his court and then they went out and they spent 40 days or just over or approximately 40 days slaughtering everyone in Baghdad up until the streets of Baghdad were flowing with the blood of men, women and children. They didn't leave. As I mentioned, this was the strategy of the Mongols, even from China. If there was resistance or if they had some reason, even sometimes not even a reason, they would slaughter and kill, they would rape and then kill and slaughter up until every man, woman and child that, that more or less was dead. Whatever was left behind was just slaves. Right, so there was no resistance once they because what they didn't want, the Mongols had a strategy that they wouldn't stay in a place for long. They hit one place, 
They don't want the next village to become strong. So they hit one city, and Baghdad was of course one of the biggest cities in the world at that time. We don't want the other cities to become strong whilst we're taking care of Baghdad. So let's quickly, and, and really a month of slaughter, just to you know, pacify or to, or to demolish a population, is a, is a very quick time. So that's what they did, slaughtered and killed. And they quickly moved on to the next township. What they didn't want, and they one of the reasons why they did that was because as they moved on, they didn't want the, the city that they have just conquered to come up behind them. So if you've slaughtered every man in that city, and every woman in that city, and the message is going out to the surrounding villages, so they're not going to come and help, and there's no one on their back when they go to the next city. So now they've made a pathway from the, from the heartlands of where they came from Central Asia, anywhere that they went, they had direct pathways. Because wherever they went, there was no resistance. Because they'd quashed and killed the resistance. So now if they wanted to go back, because of course an army, you know, of 70,000, 80,000, imagine the supply lines to feed an army like that. So they couldn't afford to have, you know, people behind them that are going to, you know, cordon them off or outflank them. So that this is what they would do. And this is what they did in the lands of Islam. And the scholars, they've written about this. Ibn Athir and others. The Crusaders, of course, did the same a few centuries later. The Crusaders did the same. Uh, not even a few centuries later, rather. They did that before. Because the Crusades started in around about 1081. 1081 Christian era. Uh, the Mongols were a century later. But the fact is that when these, when these people came... They came to slaughter and rape and spill the blood of the Muslims as it was flowing. And when people say, well, you would say that because, you know, this is your historians that have written it. And that's why we always make it clear that actually when you look at the attacks of the, Cru of the, of the crusaders of Europe, who called themselves crusaders, but they were murderers and killers, that when they entered into the holy lands of Sham and Jerusalem and so on, from the Christian, you know, chroniclers, and historians, as compared to the Muslim ones, you find that there's a lot of agreement. Because the Christians, that they wrote from several, several different angles, you know, the Christians of Egypt, the Christians of the Western Roman Empire, the Christians of the Eastern Byzantium Empire, and also the Jews that were there, that they would all write, and the Muslims would write. And if there's one thing that they all agree upon, is the slaughter. You know, the indiscriminate slaughter that took place at the hands of the Christians during the Crusades and then at the hands of the Mongols uh, who came uh, a while later. But nevertheless, the point being here, look what they do, Ahlul Bid'ah. What khair and what good do they bring to Islam? Nothing. So then he mentioned that they, uh, uh, after mentioning, if you look at what happened at the time towards the end and the collapse of Bani al-Abbas, the Abbasi Empire, or the Caliphate, what did they do with the Khalifa al-Abbasi? What did they do to him? Look what Haluka did to him. At the request of who? Of his own minister, Bid'i, Rafidi. Then he mentioned that, they, uh, that these Ahlul Bid'a, the Shia, and other than them, they agitated the Tatars, the Tatar, against the Khalifa from the east, and when they came to attack, his, he, your own, the Khalifa's own minister is coming in with the armies of the Tatar to kill the Muslims. He's with them in their ranks. Both this uh, At-Tusi, the Tusi, of course, At-Tusi is famous amongst the Kuffar. You know, when they, when they started looking at the moon, the Russians, the Russians named a planet after him. There's a minor planet in, you know, far distant from the earth, and they called that planet a small, and they called it, this is Tusi. Right, because they 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 raise him. Of course, the kuffar are going to raise these types of people. Rafi, the Persian, they called him. They they regard him to be an astron astronomer. NASA named a crater on the moon after him. This Atusi. What did Atusi do? Open up the gates for the Mongol Tatar to come in and slaughter men, women, and children. Atusi and Al Alqami. So you have to pay attention. Barakallahu fikum. Who is raised, and who is doing the raising? Of course, they are going to raise the likes of Atusi. And other than him. Barakallahu feekum. 
uh, I'll just finish this paragraph and I'll stop there inshallah for today but he said that they uh, that these individuals that they opened the pathways to the enemies of Islam the Tatar and the Mongols they made easy for them the paths into Baghdad up until they entered into Baghdad they, they destroyed it outright absolutely demolished and annihilated Baghdad and its people the Muslims and they destroyed the rest of the lands of Islam and they killed the Muslim fighters in huge numbers because now you've uh, an army of 10,000 that is ill-equipped so who's going to pick up the arms it's the farmers and the soldiers and the traders as soon as they come up against the Tatar the Tatar slaughtered them in their hundreds of thousands if not millions of Muslims that they killed and when they entered into Baghdad, of course Baghdad was a very modern city of the era. Libraries, universities, masajid, bathhouses. You know, it was, it was a very advanced city for its era. They entered into the libraries and it was the biggest library in the world at that time. Even today it would be considered as one of the biggest libraries in the world. They went in and they burned all of the books. They burned all of the books. And then they threw the remainder into the Tigris and the, the river Tigris and the river Euphrates. Up until they changed the color of the river itself. The river water, its color changed due to that which they did. And some say due to the blood of the Muslims. And they thought, this Ahlul Bid'a alongside their aiders and supporters from the enemies and the kuffar, that they thought that they had destroyed Islam itself. However, Islam is mu'ayyid, is mu'ayyid min Allahi la yuqda alayh. But Islam is aided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it cannot be destroyed. They tried. Look what they did. And you know, there's, when, you, when you actually go through, the, go through the story of what the Mongols did, and you look at it, and you imagine yourself at the time as these events are taking place, as the news is arriving in the cities, that they have conquered Bukhara, because they did. Samarkand, because they did. They built, you know, they went into Samarkand, they slaughtered the people, they demolished the palace and so on. That's so what they did, burned it down. And they entered from that side. And imagine, you know, if, if you're part of that whole you know, event that is taking place, you, your family, your village, and the Tatar are coming, and you heard what they do. What is a person supposed to do when you have Rafida like this bringing them, Ahlul Bid'a like this supporting them? What are you supposed to do? Because these are supposed to be individuals who are defending and protecting the lands of Islam alongside you, yet they are the ones who are aiding the enemy against you. So therefore, Barakallahu Feekum, Ahlul Bid'a, and bid'ah and where it, where it goes and to what degrees they will go to destroy Islam. And this is why the purity of Islam is maintained by holding on to the kitab and the sunnah. Not the pathways of the khawarij. Because you know the khawarij sometimes use stories like this to use it in their favor. Even the Shia use stories that are against them and they twist them to make it as if it is for them. The khawarij likewise, but the khawarij are the same. Look what they did to Ali. Look what they did to Muawiyah in, in the assassination or the attempt to assassinate Muawiyah and Hassan bin, uh, Hassan bin Ali and through every generation up until this time they opened the doors for Islam and the lands of Islam to be bombed and destroyed Khawarij they are the ones so these actually these events that took place in history are a lesson to Ahlul Sunnah that we do not tolerate Ahlul Bid'ah from any shade or grade that they come from. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. For those of you who are uh, going over to the dars of our brother Abu Idris, then now is the time to make that move, inshallah, because I think he will start in the next 10 minutes or so, inshallah. In uh, Masjid al-Sunnah